Hello, everybody. Hope you all are having a good day, and thank you for tuning in to this presentation. My name is Anthony Pohelis, and I'm going to be talking with you all briefly about the recording and engineering process for the performing clarinetist. This is not designed for audio engineer professionals out there that already know a whole lot more than I do. This is someone as a clarinetist that learned how to do audio engineering on the side through my doctorate at Florida State. Uh, that I've learned a couple things and tricks that I think could help all of us develop our 21st century music technology skills. And whether you choose to use that for just individual audition pre-screens or social media, that's fine. If it's just to understand how your audio engineers are doing their thing, great. Uh, for me personally, it's actually led to a career opportunity. I've been working with Arts Laureate, uh, a classical music recording company, for about a semester now, and I've fallen in love with this line of work. So this might be a, another career option for people to explore while making music. Let's begin. The goal of this presentation is for me to provide you all with a simple toolkit and some suggestions for purchasing good audio equipment, setting up and running a recording session, and post-production engineering. Ultimately, the goal is to capture your full and complete sound and musical nuances. We want to capture you, your voice as a clarinetist or musician, as much as we can, so that way your recorded product is as close as it can be to hearing you live. We want to reward all that good work that you've had on technique, tone, and musicianship without the audio getting in the way, you know? This is not meant to overly doctor your performances into perfect products. That's disingenuine uh, for a competition setting. You really shouldn't be doing most of these edits anyways. This, uh, If you're recording for auditions or competitions where they ask for unedited, you just get a good capture and send it. Don't do any of this other stuff, really. Uh, but that being said, if you wanted to do something where there's engineering, here are some of the tricks. Let's talk about equipment. So there are sort of four major categories of things that you need here. You need stuff for microphones, which also includes your microphone cables and stands. You need an interface, which is a box that connects your microphones to a computer. I'll show you what that is exactly later. A digital audio workstation, or a DAW. Uh, this is a software that's used to record, it, edit, and master your audio. And quality headphones. You want something just better than iPhone earbuds for doing this critical listening. My personal recommendation, uh, I've got Audio-Technica M50s that I'm using right now, and I do all of my classical and critical listening with these, so highly recommend. Uh, let's talk more about those other three, though, because those need a little bit more detail as to what's going on there. All right, so the microphones. There are two things that uh, we should all consider when we're looking at these. There's The first one is the transducer. The transducer is the part of the microphone that converts the sound waves hitting the membrane or metal like metal sheet plate inside the microphone and converts that sound wave into electricity for the rest of the system to process. There are two common ways in which this happens. The first is dynamic microphones. Dynamic microphones, the membrane interacts with a coil, which then passes through an electromagnetic field. And that creates the electrical current that will then go through the rest of your system and create an audio sound on the listening end. Dynamic microphones are sturdy, handle high decibels well, and no external electricity required. These are ideal for live ampli amplification, like if you're giving a public speech and you've got a microphone handy, it's probably a dynamic mic. And generally loud instruments, uh, percussion, I don't mean like orchestral classical percussion, more like drum set in this case, uh, pop bands, etc. Something where uh, you really don't need like the subtle, fine-tuned nuance recordings, like you just need to capture it all and you know get a generally good sound. Uh, condenser microphones are the ones that we use in the classical music recording scene. Uh, these are where the membrane vibrates against an electrically charged plate. Long story short, with a whole bunch of science, that means that we need to require an external electrical current or called phantom power. This is why we have an interface. Interfaces provide that power to make these microphones work. We use these as opposed to dynamic because they're capable of capturing a much wider dynamic range and tonal spectrum. So they're much more ideal for recording classical musical instruments. Always use a condenser mic. And the other thing with microphones is polarity. So polarity is where in the space around you the microphone picks up sound. There are four types I want to show you right now. And for each of these charts, uh, imagine that the 
This is sort of like a bird's eye view looking down at the microphone. North is the front of the microphone. South is behind the microphone. East and west are to the left and right. So omnidirectional microphones are equally sensitive to sound from all directions. So you see in this case, it's a perfect circle, which really in reality is actually a perfect sphere. I'll show you in the next slide. So anywhere, wherever that sound is coming from, the microphone will pick up well if it's omnidirectional. The one to its right, cardioid, looks like a heart, sort of an upside down heart, right? And so this one is strongest directly in front of the microphone, as opposed to behind where there's very little uh, pickup that you can get from the rear. Uh, sides, kind of okay, but this one's really good for capturing sound up front. If you look below that one, the hyper or super cardioid has a tighter focus on that heart. So it's more directed to the front. The sides are dampened even further, but you can sort of see it on this one. I'll show you more on the next slide. There's a little bit of a receptiveness in the back behind the microphone. And then moving clockwise to the left, that last one, the figure eight bidirectional, pretty self-explanatory, really strong capture in the front, really strong capture in the back, almost no capture in the sides. And here is just a picture of all of those polar patterns in a more 3D space. Imagine the right side of the picture is the front for each of these. So you've got your perfect sphere, your cardioid, et cetera. So ultimately this boils down to what microphones do I recommend? I am not experienced enough in this field having only been in it just casually on the side for not even two years and professionally for not even a semester. So I do not have all of the answers on all the good, bad, and my good and bad microphones. Here are just a couple I recommend at different price points. You've got the DPA 4006. This one is a condenser omnidirectional. You can get two and use them as a stereo pair for good left and right hearing. Uh, these are great. They've got a wonderful capture. It sounds beautiful. You can get a really nice capture of the whole room around you, but they are quite expensive at $4,600 US dollars for a pair. A little bit more cost effective, you've got the AKG C3000. This one is a condenser cardioid. This can be used to pick up a uh, sound by itself, or you can throw it into a mix with, for example, omnidirectionals for a blend. And this one runs for about 300 US dollars. My sort of budget recommendation is a Blue Yeti X. These are often uh, suggested as microphones for podcasters, streamers for things like YouTube or Twitch, but uh, they're actually quite nice classical musician microphones. They're condensers. They have a changeable polarity, so you can make them omnidirectional or cardioid or other options, and there's no interface required. Uh, so you don't have to plug it up into an interface into your computer. It just goes straight from the computer, straight to the computer through a USB. And this is about 170 US dollars. Speaking of interfaces, let's start talking about that. All right, so we are done with microphones. Let's move on to interface. Interface is the box where the microphones get connected blend, and you know all of the inputs are mixed together and it sends that signal to the computer. So then you can do all of your audio work that way. So with this, you've got on the left, you've got microphone jacks that will connect to microphone cables. Uh, you've got two inputs there. You've actually got some inputs in the back on this PreSonus Studio as well. On the right, you've got all of the dials that you can use to adjust the gain level of each microphone, as well as like a master setting for all of them put together. If you look at the center, you've got all the meters showing like the gain levels. And then in the top left, you see that 48V button, that's phantom power. So that's the button that every time you're doing stuff, you need that button to be glowing and on, otherwise your microphones are not going to work at all. So make sure you do that. Uh, and of course, when you get one of these, be sure to install any appropriate drivers to make them work with your computer. Usually you'll get this from the manufacturer's website. And digital audio workstations. This is the software used to edit audio. Uh, you've probably heard of many of these before. Adobe Audition, Samplitude by Magix, GarageBand by Apple, Logic Pro, Audacity. Uh, there are plenty of options out there. And I'll show you my recommendation down below in just a second. But the other thing you want to consider is having computers that can handle the sort of intense workload that these programs do. So instead of a regular computer's uh, hard disk drive or HDD, you want to get a computer with a solid state drive. Long story short, these are much more powerful. They work faster and they'll be able to handle that really intense export at the end when your computer is rendering this all down into the final product. 
and you want about 16 gigabytes of RAM or, you know, uh, short-term memory for this. So my workstation of choice for us for this purpose is Adobe Audition. It's very user-friendly. Uh, I think of the ones I've looked at, it's the most intuitive for beginners. And what's really nice for those of you on budget is if you are involved in university life at all, be that student, faculty, graduate assistant, what have you, oftentimes your universities have access to the Adobe Creative Cloud available to students, faculty, and staff for either free or very, very cheap. I took advantage of this at FSU and it saved me a lot of money getting some good recordings. So definitely take a look. And everything that I'm showing you today as far as the process will be done through Adobe Audition. All right, that is it for equipment. Let's talk about how this all starts to fit together. So uh, in general, you, I found that microphones tend to work best with the clarinet about six feet away from where you're playing. It gets a good balance of the core of your sound and getting a little bit of the room around you. Feel free to experiment though. When you're Once you have this all plugged up and testing it, play it, move it in some different spots, figure out, see what works for you. Connect the microphones to the interface using the cables, put them into the interface. And then the interface connects by USB, typically, to your computer. Don't forget the phantom power button. Do not forget the phantom power button. You need that to work. And then, obviously, you'll have to turn the interface on first. There's a switch in the back. If you're doing stereo recording, where you want a stereo pair for left and right differentiation, you've got to make sure that the left and right is from the audience perspective, not your perspective there. So if I'm sitting in the hall of an audience and I'm looking at you as the player, that's the left and right that my ears should be thinking of and when I put them into their proper channels. Uh, if you look at the picture I have right there, I you know, correctly identified which one is left and right. All right, so setting this up in Audition, you want to open up Adobe Audition, create a new multi-track se session. It'll have a couple of little preset things that they want that are asking of you. Set the sample rate to 48,000 hertz. This is a standard for high quality recording. And bit depth, I left it at 24. I didn't really notice much of a difference either way. And from what I've been told, it's not huge. So I just leave it at 24. Uh, and then if you look in the picture I have here, you've got those M, S, and R buttons within each microphone track, which are the different colored tracks going left to right. Uh, the R is for record. So you got to click that and turn it red. So that way it's armed. That microphone pathway is armed to record. Then you're going to want to test this, uh, hit the big red button to start recording, and you're going to want to test this first to make sure that you've got a sound level that you're happy with. So what I usually do is I play the loudest stuff that I need for the material that I'm recording and check to make sure that that is as high as it can be on the interface without the color of your signal turning red. If it starts turning red, it's going to start clipping, which means you're going to get distortion. So you want to get it as high as it can without clipping. Once that's all set, you're ready to record. All right, so here's a couple tips just for when you're in the recording session that I found are just nice quality of life enhancements. First, you're going to start each take with a loud clap and say the take number, sort of like a movie director when they go, take one, action. It'll help you have a clear identification of where each take begins and ends. And also, if you do video with this and have a separate video camera recording, that clap is going to be super crucial to lining things up. That's a whole nother topic for another presentation, but just so you know, that's big. Uh, allow room for silence both before and after playing. This is huge as all of the white noise that you hear, just environmental noise like a light fixture, air conditioning. We have the tools to get rid of those, but there's got to be silence where you're not playing or breathing for us to separate those sounds from the rest of your sound picture. Practice recording. Recording is just as much an art as giving the recital itself just as much as fundamentals. So at least a week before, I'd be getting in the habit of once a day or maybe once every other day if you don't have the time for all the setup, putting everything together, getting it all set up, and just doing a couple takes just to get practice. Uh, pace yourself. These recording sessions are usually a little bit longer than you'd expect. So take breaks and allow more time than you would think. Uh, I've had sessions where I would be going for four hours for recording. And if I played through all of that, my face would be an absolute nightmare. So make sure you're allowing break time, too. Uh, know thyself. Uh, each of us have our own habits when it comes to recording. For me personally, I'm a take two or take three guy. My first take is always a little bit rough because I'm sort of getting the cobwebs out and sort of just, you know, getting the nerves out of my system. 
after that, I start to get either fatigued or frustrated, so it starts to just get worse. So I know once I get through my first two or three takes, I probably got a good one, so it's time to move on and go back later if I really think I need it. Uh, so just start taking notes of yourself. Um, as I said, take notes. And find out what works best for you and what your habits are in the recording process. Okay, so really quickly now, we are going to talk about some editing techniques to just add some engineering tricks to get that sound that you recorded to be just a little bit better. And starting with the next slide, I'll be showing you demonstrations with a clip that I made of my own playing and did some doctoring. So the first thing you want to do is if you've got your whole long session that you just recorded, you're going to find the section that you want to use and edit and highlight it. And then you're going to click multi-track up in the top bar, bounce to new track, and time selection. What this will do is it'll create a new track in your mix with just that clip that you wanted. And if you're using multiple microphones, it'll mix all of those microphones down to a single track for you to edit, if that makes sense. For example, this, and then if you click on that, you then have it in a separate screen that you can then edit on its own. For this case, the pink waveforms that you see above me are the clip that I isolated and are going to be working with. This will usually appear as like bounce one, bounce two. All right, so the first trick I'd like to show you is noise reduction. Uh, first, let me show you the clip of what I recorded. This is just a little bit of a phrase from the first movement of the second Weber concerto. So it's not bad quality recording overall, but there's a little bit of like a s or a hum in the back that we want to get rid of. Uh, make sure that you're wearing good headphones for this recording, for this presentation, by the way. It'll be helpful to hear these differentiations. So we want to get rid of that white noise is what that's called in the audio world. So and this is why you have silence before and after your takes. So you're going to find a section where you're not breathing, you're not playing, you're not doing anything, highlight it, and then right click capture noise print. You can also use shift P to do this as well. It'll give you a little prompt and it says your noise print's been captured. So then you highlight the whole thing and then you go to effects up top down to noise reduction process or you can also do control shift P. And then it'll show you this little window that you see above me here with like the little yellow and green and red dots. That's showing all the frequencies that are going to be reduced out of the picture. Click apply and then you get something sounding more like this. It's a little bit, just a little bit cleaner. Moving on to the next step. Next is normalization. This is the term for bringing the amplitude or volume to a target level that you're hoping for. So our goal when we are doing recordings is to have an overall comfortable sound level with audible dynamics with the headphone speakers at about a mid middle level of output. This is not adding dynamic contrast. You do, I mean, obviously you don't want to do that out of just integrity of your playing, but this is bringing all of your dynamic playing up or down to a level that's suitable to listen to and realize. So to do this, you're going to highlight it all and you're going to go to effects, amplitude and compression, normalize process. Uh, then you're going to see the window that I have above. I then click the bubble to change it to decibels instead of percentage and set it to anywhere from minus five to minus 10, depending on how loud I want it to be. That's minus five or minus 10 levels below like the cap that this program can do. Uh, for this example, I did minus 10. It's gonna give it just a little bit of a boost. Again, that's not adding dynamics I didn't do. It's getting the dynamics that I played in the room to sound more like this record, or get the recording to sound more like the dynamics I played. 
EQ or equalization is adjusting the balance of your high and low frequencies, the high pitches and low pitches. Uh, so to do a little bit of EQ work, we're going to go to effects, filter and EQ, parametric filter. Uh, this just gives you a couple preset options that you can use to filter out sounds you may not want. The two that I want to focus on are the general high pass and the general low pass. The high pass accepts high frequencies and rejects the low ones, so it'll lower the, the volume of the low frequencies. This helps get rid of rumbles and generally brightens your sound because you've got more of the higher uh, fundamental pitches going on. Your overtones will be more present. A low pass reduces the high frequencies, so it kind of darkens your sound and accepts the lows. So this also helps get rid of key clicks and like wind noise or air leakage because those are generally higher frequencies. So for the recording that I did, I've heard a little bit of air leakage and a little bit of just almost a little bit too bright ping. So here's what a low pass filter did. And the last trick is reverb. Adding reverb gives the rooms you recorded in some resonance and added warmth. In this case, uh, I go to effects, reverb, and full reverb. There's a whole bunch of settings you can adjust, but don't bother with them. I like to just go up to presets and try lecture hall as a default. It's a little bit on the wetter side or more resonant side, but I find it adds quite a bit to a recording that you record in a very dry space. Again, don't overdo it, especially with a video. If you're in a, like a dry looking space and your sound sounds very resonant, you're, it's gonna look and sound confusing. Here's some reverb. All right, uh, and that's all the tricks I'm going to show you for now. So we're going to give it one more listen of the before and the after to see what all we've done. Here's before, just the raw take. And here's with all of the editing we've done so far, plus a couple tiny little things that I did that would be more advanced for another presentation. So hopefully you can hear some of the difference. I definitely heard some and hope that the second one sounds quite a bit more polished. So there's plenty of more tricks that we can learn, such as spot healing, which is where if you hear like a little cough or a bump or something, you can isolate those frequencies in that little moment and take them out, which is what I did for like one little stop in the beginning here. And crossfading, if you have two takes where like you like the first half of one and the second half of the other, you can find a way to meet, have them meet crossover to each other. So you have one take of everything you like. So when it comes to exporting this thing, having the final deliverable audio product, export as a WAV or an AIFF file. Do not export as MP3. MP3 compresses the data into a smaller file size, but it's way less audio information. A WAV is gonna have a more complete picture of your sound. Just use a WAV or an AIFF. It's usually the default for an export in this program. And then one last thing, if you need video, sync this with audio with the video audio by lining up those claps that I mentioned in a video editor. Uh, Adobe Premiere works great. You'll have the visual of the clap sound waves, line them up, and that's how that works. Another talk for another time because there's a lot to video. And just a couple closing thoughts here because I'm basically out of time. Uh, less is more when it comes to editing. A quality capture of quality playing is 80% of the battle. You don't want to go overboard with these. You want this to sound like you. Don't try to engineer the perfect playing out of your sound. Make it the perfect encapsulation of you as a player. Your tone, your musicianship, your sound. Don't over edit this to perfection. 
if you want to get this PowerPoint, uh, it's available on request. Just shoot me an email at the email listed right there. And with the last couple seconds here, big thank you to the ICA and 2021 Clarinet Fest team for putting this virtual Clarinet Fest together. Uh, as someone that got postponed from 2020, we really appreciate all the work that you guys are putting into this. So big thank you. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. Hopefully you enjoyed this and found some fun little tricks to work with on your own. And that's it. Have a good one. Peace.